Peter R. Bregan, M.D., is called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful reform efforts. His scientific and educational work provide the foundation for modern criticism of drugs and ECT and lead the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His books include Talking Back to Prozac, Toxic Psychiatry, Medication Madness, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and now Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Welcome to the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Hello out there. Hello on another great summer day from upstate New York. It's the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour, and I'm so glad again to be talking to you, my wonderful audience. It's, uh, it's really such an opportunity to just be here and get in touch with you and talk to you, keep you a little company for an hour or so. Um, I've been on uh, two really, really good um, documentaries in the last few months, and the most recent was a week or so ago. So I want to remind you about them because they're just packed full of information, and they both show sides of, of our society and our culture uh, with other commentators that really make it worthwhile listening. The most recent is the two-night HBO series um, on the Michelle Carter case, and it's uh, called I I Love You, Now Die. And it's about the young girl, Michelle Carter. She was 17 at the time, supposedly talked her boyfriend into killing himself. That is, telling him to go back in a fume-filled truck to die. And in fact, he did die, but all the rest is very obscure about what she said to him, whether she ever said anything to him. And yet she was convicted of manslaughter. And if you look at the story of Michelle Carter, it tells you so much about what young people today are facing, but it also shows you how society is willing to sacrifice the life of a 17-year-old girl who had a very, uh, very loving, uh, very uh, active and successful early childhood until she got to be about 12, 13, and her, her grandparents died, and um, she was close to them. They lived nearby. It's a big blow to her. One after the other they went, as sometimes happens. She became a, uh, to have a, an eating disorder. She sought help for it. So here we have this young woman who is being vilified, was vilified by the attorney's office, the attorney general's office of, of her area of Massachusetts, promoted to the world as, as the epitome of the nasty girl. Actually, the attorney general, the assistant attorney general who took over, uh, assistant, um, she... Uh, I mean, she she was pretty nasty, and you can see her being nasty on the new film, which the HBO film, and you can get this film, um, you know, it's just streaming from a variety of ways. It showed on HBO, but now, I mean, you all, all are pretty much younger than me, and you know better how to how to get this. And one of the things that's talked about on the film by me and by others is this whole context of a young woman who, instead of getting good therapy, is, is put on Prozac. Her boyfriend is put on Prozac, and they're both transformed from these sweet kids, at least in their communications, and in, from everything I know about Michelle, from talking to her coaches and teachers and friends, mentors. She was just a lovely youngster um, until she kind of got withdrawn, and she never got mean. But nobody knew what was going on with her. And what did happen was that uh, facing a, a boyfriend who was threatening to kill himself, sometimes he'd say, I'm going to kill myself. He'd hang up basically on his uh, email communications, his messaging. And then he'd, uh, he'd despair for a day, just scare her to death. Very, very destructive and manipulative situation. She was a mess. A young girl who basically wanted, above all things, to help people. And here she's got a people, 
that she imagines she's in love with, he never acts like he's in love with her until she agrees in the last week and 10 days, 12 days of his life. She says, all right, if that's what you want, I'll help you. I'll coach you. I'll help you and support you in your suicide. She's still on the psych drug. She's really losing her mind. But up until then, he never says, I love you. Only does he feel understood when he's going to help when she's going to help him die. And he's older. He's graduated high school. She's entering high school. I mean, senior year of high school. He's graduated. She's entering. This is not a picture of an abusive young woman. So why would the DA come down so hard on her? Well, we, wh why would society want to portray her as this awful person? Well, did she text him to death? No, not that we know of. Two months or so after his death, when she's expecting him to communicate with her magically by email or some other method like he promised, and she sent him dozens and dozens of communications into heaven uh, where she's hoping he's gone, uh, trying to get him to communicate back, and she's just uh, feeling um, very, very frantic, and his mother emails uh, her, not email again, but... Um, messages her, you know, Michelle, I feel guilty. This is his mother. I feel guilty because I didn't protect him from his father. A few months before his death, his father beat him up so bad. This is a 19-year-old man by then, 18, 19, you know, and his father beats him up. And uh, so bad, he had a concussion. The police intervened. Um, and, um, and they charged the father. Uh, I mean, all this is going on, this boy's life, and we're going to pick out Michelle Carr. Why, why would that happen? What's going on in our culture that, uh, that we pick out the child, the girl, the, the girl, and uh, vilify her like, uh, like old witchcraft days? Um, he had multiple suicide attempts before he got into close communication with her. Um, you know... He emails her that uh, messages her that he's not gonna uh, he's not gonna get you know talk to 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 a therapist his therapist he puts on the therapist he just you know shines him on he's only gonna talk to her he gives her all the responsibility for for his life and death and and tells her that uh, she can never tell anybody else what they're talking about or he'll never talk to her again and she tries to report an earlier what she feared was a suicide attempt and he tells her if she ever does that again calls family again uh, he'll never talk to her again she's all boxed in and she's stuck in social media her life becomes talking to a young man that she doesn't see for a year she only sees him four times over their relationship. She doesn't see him for a long time. It's all all this uh, you know stuff online, um, and I mean she's in this freaky world of a kid trying to help a kid, of children essentially immature people, immature for their age. Been, been both of them through various kinds of treatment. She begs him to go to McLean where she's gone for her eating problems. He says he's not going to any hospital. Um, and there's no adults relating to them in a way that they can they understand how much trouble the kids is. Neither family is let in by the kids into the seriousness of their situation. So it's... Um, it's just a really, you know, it's just a dark place they're in. It's a very, very dark place. Now, before I, uh, I finish up on this, I want to tell you the film is really interesting. You know, I Love You Now Die. It's very interesting because you get other people talking about the situation of our children too. What in the world's going on? We give our kids over to social media. We give our kids over, and they go by themselves and exclude the adults. We give them over to therapists and doctors who give them drugs and no communication about the dangers of the drugs. And this was a young girl who's an outstanding athlete, well-loved. In fact, she was still loved in her senior year after all this stuff came out. She was vilified in the newspapers. 
The school invited her to please continue your senior year, and her fellow students gave her the award for the most likely to brighten up your day. And then it all ends with a judge saying she's guilty of manslaughter, murder. It's a form of murder, manslaughter. So what goes on with the judge? Who are they protecting? What are they doing? Well, they're protecting a lot of people. They're protecting a lot of cultural norms, drugging children. I testified all about the drugging children. The judge was not interested. The judge wasn't interested in all the science. I had a hearing and then the trial, I talked to him about all this. He didn't contradict anything I said. He just wasn't convinced. Didn't want to listen. Didn't want to pay attention. This is the world we live in now, and I am just really concerned about our children in general, and I don't seem to be able to get a lot of folks interested in it along with me. Well, before I tell you and remind you about the other documentary, which is um, is a, another very deep one. These are, these are really the tremendous films uh, by really good filmmakers. Um, this is Dr. Peter Bregan, and the way you keep up with me is by going to bregan.com, B-R-E-G-G-I-N.com, and get my frequent alerts. Sign up for free. And uh, you can listen live to this show. You can listen on um, prn.fm, but there's also a listen live line, 712-775-6850. That's 712-775-6850. There's an app for the show. Wow. And uh, if you go to my website, you'll get daily breaking news. Sometimes I talk about what's on that news, but it's always interesting. It's a tremendous feature. Um, and the, the show archives you can get to from, uh, from Bregan.com for this show. You can listen to shows going back years with some of the top reformers in the field of of psychiatry and psychology and mental health. Great interviews. Great interviews. And then uh, the last Wednesday every uh, every month, I, uh, I give a, um, a really uh, interesting open hour where you can talk to me about anything under the sun. Um, and uh, we have very great conversations. We always fill up the lines and have these good conversations. The um, and we'll be doing that um, again this this month on July thirty first. We'll have our open lines. So there's a lot going on on my website. A lot going on out there. Um, I want to talk more about kids today. Um, the um, the other film deals with children, deals with adults both, and that film is The Minds of Men. That's now had about 1.8 million people um, download it. You can get it for free through my website. Rather, really, go to, uh, go to my uh, YouTube, Bregan YouTube. You can go to it from the website or just go to Bregan YouTube. And The Minds of Men is a long, deep film about the way in which covert monies are given by the government to support psychiatric types of experimentation on people. This is not, um, you know, your uh, your abstruse, remote kind of uh, conspiracy theory. This is all documented stuff, full of documentation over the years. And I comment on it because I, you know, carried out this huge campaign for several years in the 70s where I uh, stopped the return of lobotomy and psychosurgery throughout the Western world, stopped most of it, and stopped projects at Harvard, and stop projects with uh, with a lot of racist implications uh, to them, uh, and then the violence initiative in the 1990s. And my wife wrote a book from it, the uh, uh, 
which is is about the abuse of children and and the great many uh, fo- great deal of focus on black children call it the war against children of color as a little aside when i first published it uh, with the big press they wouldn't let me call it war against children of color and they get to control things they won't, they uh, they just called it the war against children but it's mostly about uh, the war against children of of, uh, of color, and uh, and it gets into a lot of the history of racist medical research and so on. Uh, but it also gets into the funding of of projects by the federal government that involve mind control, that involve genetic eugenical kinds of research. So this stuff is real, and um, you can watch it. In the Minds of Men, which you can just get right to on my web, on my YouTube. And you can also see they did a lengthy interview of me. And you can see that lengthy interview. They gave it to me uncut. Very generous for me to put up as well. And see the HBO film. I think you will find it. Uh, uh, I think you'll find it really, really uh, important material. Now, you can call in today and talk to me, especially about kids, especially about what are we doing with our children, because it's just pretty upsetting to me how little interest there is in the massive drugging of kids. The the phone number to call in, you know, it's 888-874-4888. Give me a call. Let's talk about kids. 888-874-4888. Maybe it's being nieces, your nephews, cousins, maybe. Maybe your own children. Maybe you when when you were a child. Um, So let me uh, let me hear from you about it. 888-874-4888. Now a lot of a lot of distress has been caused in me by the recent discovery, and I want to tell you more about it, uh, that there's a lot going on aiming toward this whole business of electrical stimulation of the brains of children. It's going on already uh, without FDA approval, uh, where, where companies are, are promoting electrical stimulation of the brain uh, as a cure for everything from PTSD to um, depression and anxiety. And they talk about, you know, what low amperage uh, they're using, but they don't describe it accurately enough to know what the real energy levels are that are being put into the brain. And now the FDA has approved, it has approved a device called Monarch to put on the heads of children diagnosed with ADHD. And you put it on every night and you leave it on during the night and then you can do it as many nights as you want. You can do it forever. It's been FDA approved. There's no limits been set on it as far as I know. And they only studied only studied the, like 32 children with this device for four weeks, and now they're unleashing it on children for indefinite periods of time? What can you prove in four weeks? Well, you prove you can give a headache. <clears throat> and this is perhaps the most stunning and ignored issue in this kind of thing, which is they're aiming at changing the brainwave patterns. They consider it a success when they manage to change the brainwave patterns of children. So imagine that. Imagine that they think it's a wonderful thing to change the brainwave patterns of children. Do you think they're changing from the be- for the better by just jolting their brains with electricity in this haphazard, unproven way? What are the odds on that? What are the odds on that little Jane, little Joey, 10 years old, 12 years old, putting this device on their heads, having their brain waves changed is actually going to benefit from this. I'd say it's about zero, genuine benefit. Parents may get convinced. Maybe even the kid thinks 
He's better. But he can't be better. He is now got, she's now got an abnormal brain. The question is, how much recovery when all this stops will you have? How much permanent damage? Will we even be able to test for what the negative effects are of this kind of subtle growing up on electricity? How's that for a theme? Grow up on electricity, folks. Well, this got me so distressed, and my friend, psychologist Michael Cornwall, who first told me about it, sent me the FDA advertising. Really, the FDA is advertising this for the company. Like they're, they're, it's outrageous the way the FDA writes this stuff up. And uh, my friend Michael Cornwall, who's on hold and is going to be joining to talk some more about this, Michael and I created an organization called SPAC, S-P-A-C, Stop the Psychiatric Abuse of Children, SPAC. This needs to be a worldwide uh, tsunami to stop the abuse of our children, psychiatrically and in lots of other ways. My specialty is psychology and psychiatry, but this, the abuse and neglect of our children is... is it's just growing in these very uh, uh, culturally embedded ways with the social media and the absent parenting and the, you know, the four or five years of, sco- of schooling before kindergarten, not schooling, but, you know, years being brought up by people other than parents under who knows what conditions and what people. It's very hard to tell. So SPAC. And Michael's the director of SPAC, and uh, he's a wonderful psychologist. Uh, he is uh, sort of got an existential kind of a background, but he's done a great deal working with children over the years in his own practice, working with children and families. And also he's he has been uh, worked with the government of uh, of California. He's from California. You can Google him and find him real easy, Michael. Michael, you there? Yes, Peter, I'm here. Hi, hi. I wasn't sure whether you got to hear the earlier part of the show. Um, so I'm not sure how whether you're in a position to comment much on what I've been saying. But I've been talking some about um, Michelle Carr. Did you get a chance to listen or did you just come in now? No, I listened to the first part, sure. Oh, oh good, 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 good. Because I wasn't sure I made clear to you. And, of course, I sent you some communications later on saying, hey, I do want you to listen to the whole show. Welcome to the show and um, join in with me. Um, you know, I'm almost speechless about about things like, you know, this uh, putting stuff on the, you know, putting electrodes in the brains of kids and thinking that's a good thing to mess up their electrical patterns and really, it's not just their electrical patterns. You're, you're, you're disrupting, not stimulating. You can't even say it's stimulating. You're just putting electricity in. Who says what it is? It could be flattening. It could be. It is disruptive. It's not necessarily stimulating. It's just harming, just harming the brains of kids. And we now know that the, the Israelis have... They're advertising that they've developed something like this for ADHD, hasn't been approved in the U.S. There's just going to be a lot of people climbing on this, and there's a lot of money behind it. And it's not a small thing, but let me turn it over to you. How, how are you doing first? How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Peter. Thanks. I'm doing well. Uh, like you, uh, I'm finding happiness in each day, and then these tragic um, truths come out about, you know, the things you and I have been opposing for a long time, especially you, and especially with our, our children, uh, then it's, it's really uh, heartbreaking. And uh, I'm so grateful to you and Ginger for, of course, taking up the whole causes you have for decades around this uh, monarch uh, ETNS brain device for kids with labeled with ADHD and, you know, and starting this project with you, uh, SPAC as part of your, you know, center for the study of empathic therapy. Um, my sense is that, uh, from the response we've had, uh, you know, you wrote an article about it that was published in Madden America, 
uh, and I wrote, a, you know, another one. Uh, thousands of people have viewed those, and there's been, you know, dozens of responses and on social media. So uh, for people who want to learn more about it and, and lend their support, just kind of spread the, the alert at this point. Uh, there's that uh, email dedicated to this where if people write, I will uh, welcome their, you know, their comments or suggestions. It's spacvictory at outlook.com, spacvictory at outlook.com. But I just wanted to say something quickly, you know, for the new users, this new uh, listeners, that uh, this was really uh railroaded through the FDA with all uh, the power and the money behind it, it was, as you have you reported so clearly, with no uh, replication of the, the, the amazingly short one-month study with about 35, 30 kids in, you know, in each control group. And you know, with the, the awful side effects of these kids, children having this thing stuck on their head all night where it pulses in electricity, there's, there's like a, a patch it goes on the forehead, and then, you know, they claim, like you said, it's almost like a Madison Avenue ad that the FDA put out. Said, you know, and the electricity targets areas in the brain associated with ADHD. You know, as if there's any science that supports that. But the, but then the side effects of fatigue and tense teeth clenching and and uh, sleeplessness and uh, you know. The children not liking, you know, they, they, they complained about the tingling sensation on their head all night. God knows what that's doing to their you know, natural sleep cycles. So anyway, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm grateful that we're getting the alert out there and that people are responding. I've gotten all kinds of responses to that SPAC Victory um, email account from people from all over the world saying, we feel like you and Peter do. It's like this is... It's almost like people are going, this one really, you know, really hurt me uh, for people to hear that, that is for hurting kids. And uh, I just wanted to say something about this is kind of the latest uh, human rights abuse. I mean, I think when we talk about SPAC and the psychiatric abuse of children, we're really saying the abuse is a human rights abuse. These are children. They're minors. They have no legal standing in terms of the medical uh, treatments that they receive, and we're not at all pointing fingers at parents. Parents, you know, I've worked with parents for 40 years who are going, but I didn't know. I went to the doctor. This is, I mean, we've been going to doctors since our child was a little baby. You know, we trust these doctors. We trust these pediatricians. And we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you know, your six-year-old daughter needs medication for ADHD and uh, depression. So, of course, we we took it. So, the people who I think are committing the human rights abuses are the prescribers, the manufacturers, and actually, you know, there's culpability around this being legal. <laughs> you know, uh, some things, like you said, you know, some things uh, were legal and aren't legal anymore. You know, forced sterilization of so-called mental patients, lobotomy of mental patients, uh, you know, all that stuff was legal. Uh, uh, and in many places, it's not illegal. So I just think I just wanted to emphasize that, that I think what we're talking about here, is, even by the UN United Nations definition of human rights abuse, to take a totally vulnerable person with no legal rights to say yes or no, and then inflict this on them, uh, that's a that's a human rights abuse. I think we can we can rightfully claim it as that. Well, I think that's so, and I think I think it's a good point about the the vulnerability of the kids, and the parents. You know, parents get bamboozled. I mean, I yeah. see I see many sad parents who've been bamboozled into drugging their kids practically into oblivion uh, before they realize that actually the doctors and the treatments are making them worse and worse and worse and worse. It's commonplace for children to get worse on drugs. It's not a surprise. That's why we make a lot of adult drugs illegal for children. And, yeah. of course, uh, now we, gi we give them amphetamines, you know, by prescription. While it's, while it's illegal to give them, you know, amphetamines not by prescription for years. So, I mean, it's, 
it's just such a, it leaves me speechless. I just get this sense of, I don't know what more to say about it. Uh, why isn't it obvious to everybody? It's kind of like I felt when I first got full steam into being a reformer in the 70s. And what really got me was the lobotomies that were done so many, most of them on women and and then that they were doing them on little black kids in Mississippi. Okay. That's what really tipped me over. What can you go? Yeah. You're letting some some neurosurgeon in a segregated institution in Mississippi operate on uh, little children in uh, in this facility. Um, and uh, thank goodness, stop that. In fact, it's one place where I had a help from a from a psychiatrist who, you know, who was a director of the Department of Psychiatry. When I talked to him, he didn't know this was going on. He took action. This, my entire campaign, it was the only time that a psychiatrist, you know, with some institutional affiliation, with some meaning, actually stood up to the neurosurgeons and said, you're not going to do this. Well, yeah, yeah. Not, not on my watch. <laughs> um I think there's something well, really uh, – oh, by the way, folks, you can get a lot of detail on this on my website. Go to Bregan.com and just, um, you know, uh, spin down two or three of the banners, two or three of the, uh, you know, the first uh, banners about um, what's on the website. And you'll get to the children's page and to SPAC. And the top of the children's pages now is, is devoted to uh, SPAC. And you can see the FDA uh, uh, announcement, which literally is a uh, it's it's um, it's a press release written by the drug companies. I mean, that's what the, the FDA put out, um, mm-hmm. full of this ridiculousness that Michael said. So, uh, and you can get um, you know some of the research that's gone into this, some of the published research. Um, n- none of it is heartening. And um, I'm just I'm hoping that out there there's going to be other people, people within the organizations, people concerned with human rights who are going to say we can't do this to children. Um, it's just a, a, it's just a disaster. Um, Michael, more you know, thoughts on all of this and folks give a call in. I really like to hear from some folks today. Um yeah. Don't wait to come in on the general conversation at the end of the last Wednesday. Call in and and talk about what do you think is going on in this world that we can do this to our kids. 888-874-4888. Michael, give you the mic for a little bit here. Well, I think it's uh, for you and I who have been in these institutions of, of, you know, in the psychiatric hospitals, and I worked for 28 years in a public mental health system, I think there's a a real perspective there that um, where you see these uh, human rights abuses become best practices, where you see them evolve over time when they first get introduced. uh, And uh, and with all the medical legitimacy in the world, you know, the 25,000 psychiatrists of the APA, there's no protest down there about this happening. Uh, so there's all this incredible institutional uh, legitimizing of this. I just wanted to say, so this thing about putting the electricity on the children's heads, I've heard more outrage about that last month than I have in 20 years about children being given SSRIs and stimulants. There's something about uh, here's the pill. You take it. We all take pills. Uh, the doctor's saying this will help. I'm, you know, all that. It's the same doctor, you know, and we know now that most psychiatric drugs are not prescribed by psychiatrists. They're prescribed, you know, by general practitioners, FNPs and nurse practitioners. But there's that trust there. But let me just say something quickly that this thing about putting the electrodes on the head, I think there's something visual about that that people don't know. Oh, no, no, I don't like that. Uh, so, so no matter how they kind of uh, do the PR or the spin or whatever, uh, I think it, it just has this nightmarish quality to it. And let, let me just say, Peter, I was there on the ground, you know, in one of these public mental health systems when the SSRIs came out. You remember that when that was like this big fanfare. And I remember the chief psychiatrist, there were hundreds of mental health staff licensed people there. They had the big staffing, the big meeting, you know, the big everyone. We want to announce today a breakthrough 
in uh, of psychiatric science. And he, he, I remember seeing it, and I see it in my mind's eye. He's up there, and he's like, here's the synapses in your brain. And what, what's discovered this new SSRI that, you know, inhibits the, the reuptake of, of serotonin. He was showing how it went from one to the other and all that. He says, this is the new cure for depression. He says, and in fact, we're going to see the less and less need for some of the therapists here in our system because depression can now be cured at the synaptic level. It's a biochemical imbalance. Remember that? <laughs> but it was like everybody's going, oh, really? Uh, and so then, of course, all those people had been courted, you know, those he and all the rest of them had been courted relentlessly by the drug company reps. I'm sure they don't get in your door. But, you know, every psychiatrist I've ever known is like every day some drug company reps showing up with free samples. But I'm just saying that this stuff gets operationalized in these systems and it becomes the new normal. It becomes the standard of care. It becomes the best practice. But maybe this uh, monarch brain invasion of kids' heads, people go, no, we don't want that. Well, that's going to be interesting to see. It'd be interesting maybe for you to write up, maybe do a blog about the kinds of responses you're getting at the dedicated email. And if you want to talk, communicate with us, you know, in writing about this, again, you know, if you're listening to this show, um, you know, you've got Bregan Live uh, at Hotmail.com, Bregan Live at Hotmail.com. But if you want to, you know, engage Michael, who is uh, working uh, very much on trying to get public interest uh, around this, then then you can uh, you can get to him at SPAC Victory at uh, what is it at again, Michael? At, at Outlook. Say that again. At at Outlook dot com. Yeah, at Outlook dot com. Mm-hmm. SPAC Victory, a- S-P-A-C Victory. Um, the um, the apathy about our kids, you know, it ties into a whole bigger picture. I was uh, talking to a young man the other day who was saying um, how um, he was just sharing with me, talking with me about how uh, people are... Um, Young people are are not looking forward to getting married so much anymore. They're not, um, they're waiting until later. They're not so much looking forward to raising kids. And he thinks that especially boys, and this is going to be about especially boys. This will be. It's always the ADHD diagnosis always really gets the, the, the people who have more energy and activity and are more likely to, you know, do what they want to do rather than what they're told to do. And and by a large portion, that turns out to be boys. That we're raising boys to be shy. And as young man was saying, he said, you know, my, my friends are shy. I'm probably the least shy of them. They don't assert themselves. I've talked to professors at universities who say that we're, you know, a decade or two earlier, you really had to make sure that the young women in in the universities got to speak out to assert themselves and i've been told now you got to work on the boys asserting themselves because they've been told they're toxic they they have toxic masculinity they're embarrassed of many of them about being boys and the being young men and um uh this is a theme that is permeate, permeating the culture right now we are literally making young men think there's something wrong with them inherently, genetically, hormonally, that uh, that that they have abused and dominated. Now, there's no doubt that about the history of patriarchy. Uh, you know, I've written I've written about the male abuse of women and children. I've taught courses on the male abuse of women and children. Uh, one of my earliest books, Toxic Psychiatry, is a chapter about the abuse of women in the psychiatric system. And uh, one of the things that maybe was a little bit more uh, predicting the future than I thought, I talked about how uh, men were 
were, were treated in the psychiatric system on the model of the abuse of women. You know, told to shut up, sit down, don't talk, don't stand up for yourself. And now we're seeing that model being perpetrated in school, in psychiatry, and we're seeing we're raising more and more children who don't feel they can be assertive of themselves and stand up for themselves and stand up for other people and and to be aggressive in good causes, not violent, but to, to be aggressive and to stand up for what they believe and what they believe is true, not violently. And I don't know how much of this you're seeing in the world around you, but I think we have a very large pattern now going on that is uh, aimed at subdu- subduing our boys. I, I see that too, and I think it's a combination of those uh, social, cultural reasons. And also, um, I was just thinking as you were talking, uh, if how many kids now that, that start getting these psychiatric meds when they're toddlers What's 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 the ratio, you know, in any school given classroom or any school? Uh, what do we know now? Like one in what ten or seven boys are on psychiatric meds, and uh, this whole thing around you know, done volumes and huge work on that, and, and on, on on the SSRIs too. Uh, but I just think I mean, a lot of these kids that I saw ended up you know, getting put on both uh, the stimulants and the antidepressants. And I think there's, I mean, if if we looked at it kind of in terms of the the overall energy level of any kind of uh, group, if if that many people are being medicated and and their emotions numbed, and, and, and like you say, a good share of them are boys, I think it's just, there's, there's like this kind of critical mass of, you know, this is, this is the new expectation that people, uh, you know, and the people, of, the kids I've seen who got put on meds, not because I ever referred them there, but because maybe they were in the foster system. And, you know, that's kind of a, a huge tragedy, too, that, you know, that's become the new expectation for social workers if you have kids in the foster system, that it's almost expected that they be medicated, you know. So then you see, you know, there's like 600,000 kids in the foster system in the U.S. And so there's like this, I think there's just this... Uh, numbing numbing of people of children's emotions and it's uh it's tragic i think it is a human rights abuse i I was thinking today as i was listening you know i've read some of the things you've uh written you know about the michelle carter tragic situation and her boyfriend killing himself those ssris i mean when i think about her being put on ssris when she was 12 i mean then you're talking about years of that and as you know because you're I think the world expert on the SSRIs you know uh, talking back to Prozac and everything and um, that the two groups when I saw kids getting put on SSRIs one they just kind of went numb and I think we've heard that report too that people will say you know I was on it for years and the w- reason I liked it because I just didn't feel anything I, and the things that upset me didn't used to didn't upset me anymore so I was just kind of on hold, and I realized five years later that I hadn't really been functioning, really. And then there's the other small group, but it's pretty big, of people who have the black box warning effect of they really uh, lose their impulsive con- impulse control. I saw that over and over, Peter, on kids who got put on SSRIs, who I knew them. I'd known them for two or three years who'd been in foster care, and they got forced on the SSRIs, sometimes within a couple of days. Oh my goodness, what a change in their baseline, you know? So, uh, but those drugs, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, if you have, I mean, there's one in four women in the United States on psychiatric drugs. How many kids are on drugs? Doesn't that just make everything a lot less quiet? It's, yes, I think some of the uncivility in our society that's been growing has to do with the effects of psychiatric drugs, particularly the antidepressants. And folks, I have a free resource center which you uh, on antidepressants, and you can go in there and look up children and antidepressants and see how clearly the research has shown 
from the very beginning with Prozac that large percentages of kids put on these drugs in clinic settings where they can where they follow them 20 30 40 50 percent develop behavioral abnormalities uh, the resource yeah. center you can go to directly is 123antidepressants.com see how easy i make it i make it as easy as i can free resource center 123antidepressants um Dot com. Let's talk more positively about what what do our kids need? What do, you know, all human beings basically need the same things. They need love, they yeah. need supportive relationships, they need as they grow up, especially uh, uh, parenting, coaching, they need uh, they need help learning how to behave learning what the parameters are of impulse control, learning that they can be creative, learning that they can be loving. In my practice, I, I don't work with preteens without the parents. And right. in, even in teenagers, ideally, I want to have the parents involved because when parents learn new approaches to children, Teachers, I'll try to involve teachers when I can. When teachers decide on new approaches to children where they combine uh, some very simple principles, the kids change. I mean, one principle is you, you hold children responsible for being good. You don't say you have a mental illness, you can't be good, you can't control yourself. You know, gently and in a kindly fashion, you hold children responsible for being good, being respectful. And you tell them that you're doing the same thing, that you're holding yourself to a standard of being good and respectful, and they can do the same. And you teach parents to set limits on children for everything except love. You know, you can set limits on their behaviors, especially in regard to respect. Because if you can teach a child to be respectful, they're going to do okay. They're going to be able to relate to other kids. They're going to be able to relate to other adults. They're going to be able to benefit from other people. So you teach respect and you model respect. And then you encourage them to seek loving relationships, you know, to seek out a teacher or a friend who's going to care, and you care for them too. These are not complicated principles that we need for helping kids grow up. And yet... We want to do these awful things to their brains. And I guarantee parents that if, if, if your child's problems are really limited to something like ADHD, that is that the kids are talking out of turn, they're basically being undisciplined and disrespectful, that if they work with me for two weeks, they're going to see a change. And I might see the kids once or twice they usually love the fact that I tell them they can control their behavior. They really do. They really love it. Um, you really can. You really, really can uh, control your behavior. You don't have to be taking drugs or be diagnosed with something. Or in this now we're going to be saying you can. You don't need those electrodes on your head for God's sakes. Like you're something from out of space. You're a normal child. You can learn to control your behaviors and you can grow up and and learn to handle the adult world and become an adult. Um, these very general ideas that you then get very specific about in my practice with how do you talk to a child? And, you know, and, and often the kids catch on to this, uh, you know, very quickly. I don't want to romanticize children. They have their issues and their problems and growing up is hard. But children can often hear right away that, you know, we want to be respectful to each other. And a child might say, well, does that mean that dad can't hit me anymore? We say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think, dad. What do you think? I think uh, in a, if we're being respectful to each other, um, you're going to learn ways to, to uh, help your child understand what's right without hitting them. So no more hitting, no more yelling, no more screaming. We're going to work together. And people understand this. Children understand this. Oh, take a breath, Michael. Well, that's the good news. And my experience is everything you just said there um, 
absolutely works, just as you described it. And so I think, yes, we can be advocates opposing, you know, what is injurious, but the good news is, on the other hand, we have experience, and uh, it's not just uh, <clears throat> anecdotal. You know, there's all kinds of research, too, that supports this kind of humanistic, uh, you know, your empathic therapy center. There's, there's, it, it really works. And uh, when I worked for the county there for 28 years, almost all the families we saw there were, uh, you know, in really dire straits in terms of the neighborhoods and just the whole uh, stresses and traumas going on. Uh, even under those really adverse uh, uh experiences that I had much the same approach and would would even with kids who had been bouncing in and out of juvenile hall and getting suspended and expelled from school parents would come in and we're just at a loss so we've lost this young man or young woman I said no let's let's meet together and I would I would always like you say I would always meet with the, the parents and the, the young person I would often then, you know, spend time alone with a young person, too. But uh, I think it was a mistake when I'd see other people, the parents would just drop off the child or teen and come back in an hour, you know. No, I, I always <laughs> wanted to, you know, be, for the reasons you described there, is like this is a real uh, family here, and everybody has, uh, you know, their feelings, their emotions, their needs. And uh, like you said, sometimes when that respect was given to everyone in the family and just saying, you know, uh, keep coming back and, you know, we can help help move everybody forward. That's the good news. It, it really does work. I mean, uh, the sad news is, uh, you know, not to get back in the sad area again too much, but, you know, there's been a reduction in those kind of uh, therapy services in in these county systems across the country and, and for the same reasons we're describing uh, that NAMI and, you know, psychiatry and the pharma companies, basically, where I worked, they came in and said, you know, you don't need all these child and family therapists anymore. Uh, just, uh, you know, just more psychiatrists and more meds. So the pushback of that against that is just kind of an endless thing. But the, the good news is it works. Absolutely works. People need people. And children yeah. especially need, you know, loving, ethical adults in their lives. And big brother programs can make a huge difference. Uh, coaches can make a huge difference. Ministers can make a huge difference. Um, the uh, you know, kids, kids need love and attention and guidance. Yeah, that is the most important thing for them to have, and we can't substitute teachers and principals and parents with a mechanical intervention into the brain of children. This is an atrocity. This is bizarre beyond belief. The drugging of our kids, and now what we're going to happen is the electrifying of our kids, putting electrodes on their heads at night. Uh, because, uh, you know, the reason they do it at night is, uh, I think, in part that they don't want to, it's more shameful to anybody be seen like that during the day. But who yeah. knows eventually, uh, oh, yeah. you know, where we're going to be going because we'll we'll have kids asking for these devices. I mean, what do they know? Little Timmy's got one. I want one, too. I want to I wanna uh-huh. fix my brain. I want to fix my brain waves. Oh, no. Children will believe anything you tell them, and they may believe it for the rest of their lives, as we know as therapists. Children get told they're evil and bad, deserve to be abused. They come to us when they're somewhere between 25 and 85, and they're still going to believe it, unless they really find a way to face this misindoctrination. And we're indoctrinating all of our children to believe that a large number of children are defective and have defective brains and need physical interventions into their brains. This is um, just an atrocity. It is out the ceiling. Someday if society makes progress and 
there's, there's, there's no reason to believe we necessarily make progress. We make, we've certainly made a lot of progress in the last few hundred years in some ways. And we've also had the, the two worst world wars we've ever had, and we've had the biggest slaughters in history. So, you know, is progress made? Are we even sure that it won't be a worldwide dictatorship next? I mean, you know, but if progress is made, this is this period where we treated our children with drugs and electrifying them and is going to be looked back upon as insanity, worldwide insanity. Yeah. So join us. Join SPAC. You can join SPAC by uh, uh, going to my website and uh, to the children's page. And you'll get a connection to the Empathic Therapy Center and you can join and write us and tell us you just want to support this effort. We're going to do it anyway, but boy, we'll do it better with support. <laughs> we yeah. might even win as I've done and we've done in a few of our bigger efforts and, and really stop some of this horrible stuff from, um, you know, ha from just continuing and happening. And there really are better ways, but we won't do them. One of the most worst things about psychiatry is that it tells us you don't need to do the work. Yeah. Teachers can have all the have have their most difficult children from their viewpoint, the ones that are full of life and bouncing around. They can have their more difficult children drugged into submission. Uh, it doesn't last very long, usually. I mean, usually the brains are fighting back, but then they give the kid more drugs. And but uh, you know, we live in a world now where a lot of teachers assume a percentage of children need to be drugged. What kind of craziness is that? We live in a world where large numbers of parents now have been taught to believe that children need drugs. This is, uh, this is just a craziness, and we really need folks to buckle down and say, no more of this. No more of this. This is just corporations working with government agencies hand in hand, as they so often do selling malarkey, damaging, dangerous malarkey to the public. It's uh, really a bad news situation. And the, the device people, the, the division on devices, rhymes with vice, that the FDA is just a den of evildoers. They support shock, they support this. <laughs> a few last words, the music is upon us. Okay. I'm, I'm running toward the end here, Michael. Well, you said it, it's love. Let's all listen to our hearts. Let's love our children and love ourselves. Because when we love ourselves too, then it that value is where it should be. So let's listen to our hearts. Thanks for listening, folks. I know this is hard stuff. Not all my shows are such hard stuff. But we got things to do something about. Thanks for listening. Thanks for doing. Be in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs>